Hi, I'm Dave. I'm Buddy. And welcome to our eight part series on unpacking reactivity and technically leash aggression. So the idea of this eight part series is that you can watch it in order and then create a basic program to get yourself started if you're working remote and you can't access a trainer, but we would always advise that you partner with a local trainer because you need some in-person coaching on this topic. As uh, with every episode, we're going to give away some of the famous beefy balls. Uh, our last word is was Dunny Budgie, which is was a what? What was that? Uh, blowfly. The blowfly. Uh, this week, it's going to be, or this episode, it's going to be puppycock, which is... No idea. Okay. So puppycock, when, if you hear me say that, write down the timestamp in the comments of your social media platform, and we'll send you two of our beefy balls. Cool. The first person will get to the first person. If you comment first in best dress. Yes. Yeah, first in best okay. dress. We, we can't give away a thousand. So, yeah, so. I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, That's reasons. a pretty important caveat. Sorry. <laughs> Reason. Sorry yeah. Reasons for um, reactivity and uh, leash aggression. So what are the reasons behind this? Let's break some of them down. Probably the, the two, um, we might just start with two because they, they are contrasting a little bit. And, and that's fear and prey. So ultimately, the goal of fear in a dog is to increase space. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it's a negative emotion. The animal is feeling uncomfortable. Now, often the process with fear is at, that, we, that we see is overt aggression. So the dog might actually decrease the space rapidly to then be able to increase space. So just be mindful that if your dog, you feel like your dog is fearful, but it presses forward, hard and forward, um, that may well still be a fear response in your dog, but the idea of that is to ultimately increase space. And that is quite different to a prey-driven dog. So a prey-driven dog yeah. is ultimately trying to decrease space. It's trying to get to that animal and potentially capture that animal. Prey is also heavily dopamine fueled. So it's an invariably positive thing for your dog. Fear is not. So they're very, very contrasting emotions. Can you, can you lead off talking about how that barking, that lunging, that growling, that approaching, uh, in some cases, obviously we won't go too deep into it, but even dogs that are a little timid that start biting, how can that be reinforcing for the dog so they learn that's a coping mechanism. As far as like, these dogs practice these behaviors, yes? Yeah. So, why, do, in your opinion, like, fuck, how do I say this? I mean, I, I guess- why, why is barking reinforcing? Correct, like, yeah, why, why do people tend to, I got it now. <laughs> people say, this is increasing. This started as something and now it's worse than it was. Can you talk about why that, that is, for the most part? Well, it's going to depend a little bit on the driver, but but if it's um, so for a fear-based dog, if they bark a lot and make a lot of noise and fuss, and then the dog, if you're walking on a lead, and then ultimately the other dog keeps going in the other yeah. direction, yeah. then that has created space. So that is a reinforcing behaviour. Barking is also self-reinforcing. For a prey-driven dog, that barking and that feeling in the end of the lead feels good, and leaning into the pressure feels good. So both um, both ultimately reinforce the, the behavior. The, another differentiating point That's on very, that as well very is- Very clunky way to ask that question, sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the other differentiating factors as well is the type of bark. So, so a very prey-driven dog, you'll, you'll hear sort of whiny, very, very high-pitched barking. A very defensive dog will often bark deeper and louder. So you're hearing something very different. High-pitched, prey, it's almost whiny and yappy. It's a very annoying sound. Uh, that lower sound is as a far more defensive response and is going to be more driven by uh, fear. Your first steps working with a dog that's showing the fear, we'll put the prey aside for a second, the fear and anxiety, your first approaches to working with dogs like immediately you'll walk in and be like, oh, this dog's a little on the timid side. What's your first approach that you start working with? So it is, it is quite different. The, the, the rest of the categories we're gonna look at will actually clump together quite significantly and the approach will be quite similar, but fear is distinctly different. So 
probably one of the first things that I would be looking at is, is really just the dog's overall development and the style of habituation that that dog has had to date in terms of its development. So what is the dog's general environmental confidence like? If the dog feels just uneasy mm. in multiple environments, well then we, we would, I would almost go back to a puppy development process of, of just a, a, like a pretty stringent and, and, and comprehensive habituation program, which is, is different to socialization. It's very much yeah. just about quite often building neutrality out in the environment. Socialization is more about creating a more a, a positive relationship with various things in the environment. For a lot of these fear dogs, we just want them to be neutral um, to, to a whole bunch of stimulus and sometimes have a positive association. But, but that's where I would actually go back to is just looking at the dog's just yeah generalized development and how do we get the dog more, more comfortable. And then the second to that, once we've done the environmental work, the second part of that is then looking at the handler relationship and then really trying to develop, like we were talking about in previous episodes, how do we develop um, that engagement and the value in the handler. I think a lot of people might underestimate a little bit how much, and now it doesn't mean, like if we say fear and anxiety, it doesn't necessarily mean the dog's quivering, but a good example is what Dave's talking about is we might go out into our back area and we have an A-frame out there and we have it set quite low, so it's not overly, it, it, for most dogs, it should be, so they jump on it and there's no problem, but it's a great example of that. If I get a dog over to that A-frame and the dog goes, oh, what's, oh no, I don't know, I don't like this. If they're feeling that about an inanimate object that isn't overly scary, you can imagine how the rest of their worldview might be going. Yeah. And it's really hard to combat that if you're not able to actually show them, hey, you can jump on this, that's okay. It's a slippery surface, that's not too bad. So I think that habituation stuff is super, super important leading into anything before there's anything to do with other dogs or anything like that. And stress will stack too. So you're gonna have, and that creates a significant problem when developing um, these dogs. The other, the other thing to be, just a simple strategy that you can all start playing around with as well, when, you, when you're dealing with a dog that's fearful of something, one of the tendencies that we have is to feed on the item, so or feed towards the item. So you try and lure the dog in. Let's say the dog is scared of a broom and you've got the broom lying on the ground. We try and lure the dog in with food and put food in and around the broom. Well, you're actually feeding at the mm. point of, of stress. So it significantly loses its value by, by doing that. So one of the strategies I learned years ago, even in my animal training career, um, and we, I, I learned this from actually when we were trying to ship and move animals. So we had to actually get elephants trained in a crate at yeah, one point no and way. ship them across to another point in the zoo and we also um, had some elephants come from overseas so they need to be very comfortable in their box crates for travel purposes. We didn't try and lure the dogs, uh, the elephants um, into that environment. We would actually let the elephant go up and explore and then mark it to let it know that's a good response mm -hmm. and we'd feed back away from it. So the, the, the source of food and reward came away with distance from the thing. So the animal could actually enjoy the reward, not be still feeling the pressure of being near it and then eat the food. It could actually step back from it and go, ah, oh, sweet, I got something good for that. I'll go explore again. And the speed in which the animal will start to investigate and move into those things is significantly faster than if you try and lure the animal in. The other thing is, is like people, like dogs that are concerned around people. One of the, you don't want people yeah, to be trying to yeah. lure the dog in with food, it's a very creepy thing. It will be akin to a, a person in a van trying to lure a child in towards that van. That's probably a stupid and awful example, but um, but but it's it's, it's 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 creepy as fuck. Like, don't do it. It's it's a creepy thing, and your dog feels that. You're like being the creepy dude trying to lure the dog in. The better thing to do is sure you can potentially give that person some food, but throw the food way away past where the dog is at. So um, if the dog is a meter from that person, throw the food like three meters almost back towards the handler. So so create space from the thing and then the, the dog, elephant, human, will actively probably feel more comfortable coming up and exploring. So take the pressure out of those um, interactions. So this is really important with fear-based dogs is that we don't want to lure them into pressure cookers. We're happy for them to explore, but then mark and reward away from them. Yeah, super profound. Dogs that are frustrated, maybe the most common, maybe the most common that we see for the reactivity. Yeah. What types of frustration? So the, the 
In terms of frustration, we're typically talking about dogs that have that uh, have been heavily socialized and, and the type of, it's not just about being heavily socialized, but it's the type of socialization from a very, very young age, which has been adrenaline fueled play with other dogs. Mm -hmm. and, and the other place where that can happen, so it's not just about certain types of puppy schools, but it's also dog parks. Um, so the, the, the main issue with a dog park environment is that dogs are meeting unknown dogs. So one of the simple examples and ways to picture this is many of you have been to Southeast Asia, like a Thai or Bali beach where you, you might see beach dogs floating around. Those are a really good example of what feral domestic dogs would actually do um, or because that's what they are that's, that's why they do it and um, and you'll see that they live in loose packs typically but they'll have certainly a territory that they're working in and when dogs are crossing over at that point of territory then there's all you'll see nearly every day conflict happening either over resources or, or boundaries. Now, some rare dogs can cross between two, but most can't. So that's what we typically see, loose packs that have a base territory, and if they start crossing over, you'll see heavy, heavy conflict. So it's not natural for a dog to roll into an environment where they don't know other dogs, and then just greet them. So even if the dogs are good in that setting, and, and many are, don't get me wrong, there's still a high level of adrenaline associated with meeting a dog that you don't know. So anytime that could happen, as per biology, that could mean death. And and it's and most domestic dogs are certainly not thinking like that, but but some are, which creates that very, very strong adrenaline response. But at, as a minimum, most dogs are aware that harm could be caused, which is what puts them on high alert. So even if you see them doing that happy like dog dance where they, they're meeting and greeting and they're all stiff and then spinning and it looks kind of playful, there is also a level of anxiety underlying that and, 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 and a high level of awareness. And that's really just about survival. So that scenario of a dog park can create um, really, it's, it's a un, very unnatural situation for dogs and, and it can create that adrenaline response that then creates so much issue for you um, on lead um, at, at a later point. So it's just important to be mindful of that. We're not saying don't take your dogs to the park and play with other dogs, but the way to do it is to have known mates in the area and then your dogs get to play with known mates. Our daycare program, all dogs have to come in on the same day each week. So we develop groups, they all know each other. It's not, we do know there's no casual daycare in our, in our daycare settings. So we can actually develop do, do, uh, dogs in those groups and we see them getting better and better as the, the weeks go on. Dogs meeting unknown dogs should always be a stressor as per what your dog is. And, and, and we're all about dogs being dogs here and we want to embrace that for what they are. It doesn't mean some dogs can't be fine doing these things, but for the most part, if your dog is a reasonably driven dog, these all of these issues will be exaggerated. I, I think one thing <clears throat> that's important for a lot of people to understand is that the, the reason I think why the dog park and the dog walking nicely on lead and all this is, is I, I would argue, and you may, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, it's, it's the, the minority of dogs. It's not the common thing where you can just unlet the dog go in the dog park, come fine, walks home, no problem. Yes, some dogs can do that. But we see endless times where that's not the case with most dogs. But because those dogs are so visible, those are the ones that you see at the footy oval, at the dog park, uh, walking down the street. <laughs> those are the ones that people go, oh, my dog should be acting like that. And I just think for most people to understand it's perfectly fine. They're the, those dogs are great. That's cool. But that's the minority. Most dogs are going to have some uncomfort, some discomfort meeting other ones or whether it may be that. So... Yeah, I just think that, that having that as an expectation probably isn't fair because it's just suited for the dog. And, and, and often for a lot of people, it becomes the dream. It's sort of like, yeah, I want that Have scenario. a coffee and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and it's not, that's not fair to dogs. So that's that's the main concern I have with it. That's You're not working with the dog's biology. So, so having, I guess, a zoo background for me, I always, I try and look at it from the perspective of what does the animal need? What, it's not about the human aspect of it. What, what on a core basis does that animal need? And that animal really wants its internal pack, its crew, and that can be a little bit extended. It can have playmates outside of just your immediate family, um, is where all of the value lies. And we want to protect our dogs from, from harm and, and these external situations. So that is more a natural situation. Now I took my 
German Shepherd, very, very driven, high prey drive dog to a park, very local to me this morning, and there was about 10 dogs running around and, and sort of all in the mix. And it, through that process, she didn't sniff a dog. She was just doing some training with me and, and, and chasing a ball and we were able to go. We had some dogs come up and because she's very, very neutral in terms of dogs, there was no issue that, that came off the, um, off the back of that. So, so through this process as well, what we're talking about, you can still go do what that end picture is of, of going to these places where there is a bit more stuff going on. But I'm always hyper vigilant and looking for problem, yeah. problematic dogs in that scenario. The park near me, pretty people are generally pretty conscientious, but there's plenty of parks where people will basically pick a rehome dog up, not know much about the dog, go straight to the park and let that dog go. And then you're playing roulette with your dog. Um, and it, your dog might be great. It doesn't mean the next dog is going to be. Um, and that's a main concern. I think every dog I'll ever raise from here till ever will be teach them the 99% rule that just, hey, 99% of dogs to you don't matter. They don't matter. The 1% that matter are the mates, the ones I know that you get along with, that you can socialize, you guys can ha have a party, do your thing. But 99, probably more, percent of dogs, every dog on the street doesn't matter to you. And that, that's just what ties back into this frustration element is that if we give so much external reinforcement to the dogs and then all of a sudden we strap them on a lead and go, hey, by the way, you can't go over there now, boom, yep. we get these blow ups. Yep. Um, you mentioned prey drive here. So this might be, prey drive comes in, I guess, multitude of, of it, it manifests itself in multiple different ways. Yeah. So. So prey drive is in, in most dogs. So, so what we know about domestic dogs is that the many are scavengers, but most will have a level of prey in them and that level of prey will um, prey, prey drive will vary. So some would certainly, if they were in a, in a feral um, scenario, then they would be chasing and hunting, stalking, hunting, chasing prey and killing prey um, and eating it. So um, that process of prey drive is a, is a key driver in, in our dogs. And, and it's really, really important to understand, I guess, firstly, the, what it looks like in terms of a trait. So dogs fix staring, trembling. So they see a dog, fix, stare, tremble. Okay, and that, like we were talking about before, that really high pitchy bark, and then just chasing and stalking. So you'll see it a lot in working type breeds. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing to understand is that, that prey drive is something we want in a working dog. It's something that will ultimately be the engine that will allow the dog to significantly work and sometimes work for long extended periods with a higher level of energy and focus. So we actually need that in the dogs. And, and when we talk about prey, we always talk about it in as a flowing river. So if you've got a dog with high prey, there's a flowing river of prey within that dog. Now we wanna channel it into positive tasks. So the idea is we channel it into positive outlets with us, sport, or something that's going to actually assist the dog in its overall well-being throughout its life. The problem is if we don't give it outlets, it's going to spray it, out it everywhere finds them somewhere. <laughs> you, you don't want. So you end up with a dog that might be a cat killer, or your dog just stalks and chases and hunts down little dogs in the park. Um, you can end up with prey sort of spilling out everywhere that you don't want it. The other, the other thing that you also, we also need to be very conscious of in terms of prey drive is that if we try and block it off, if we shut it down, then that in itself firstly doesn't work because it'll start bubbling and leaking, mm. but then you typically, it can create a lot of anxiety because the dog's not getting a level of fulfillment. So what we're looking for in terms of developing a dog is, is to create a dog that feels to a degree biologically fulfilled. And a big part of that is, is those internal drivers that your dog has, it, it gets an outlet. And, and just a really quick example, when I was in my mid teens, I always wanted to play football. Um, one of my parents didn't want me to play. Um, the other one was kind of okay with it, but for about a year, I didn't really play much sport. In that period of time, I felt very angsty and I felt quite different. I wasn't really, I was just going to school and then just hanging out and playing with mates. About a year in, um, I started playing football, training a couple of times a week, playing on the weekends, and I just felt more relaxed as a human being, just immediately the shift and change in that. So that's on a human perspective, and I don't have a desire to go chase rabbits. But if you are a dog and you have a significant amount of prey and it's you've been bred generation after generation to have quite extreme prey, so you'll go work really hard and then we don't give the dog an outlet for that, then it's gonna come out in all sorts of places that we don't want. 
My, my recommendation for, for most people is if you do have a young dog that does start ex expressing this, I remember um, you were obviously very uh, fundamental in my growing, my raising with Hawk. And I just, there was one day when he hit nine months or whatever, I told you I opened the door and he used to just come with me, boom, he went and chased a bird. And I think a lot of dogs that have this go, they go, oh, well, that was crazy. He chased a bird today. And my immediate thinking was, no, 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 no. That cannot be a thing. Because once you get these dogs, any dog that has, it doesn't even need to be a, a, a Malinois. It can be just anything that has, oh, that's fun. That becomes reinforcing so quickly. And it can be something as simple as what I did is I went and found a bunch of pigeons. And I grab the ball and I say, hey, let's, let's play around this. And just the quicker that you can make that, hey, let's not do that. Let's do this. I, I just think it's really, really important rather than waiting two or three years and then being like, fuck, I'm, I don't know what to do anymore. It's a big problem. And, and so that, that, there's a two-pronged process of just blocking it. You don't have to correct it. Just don't let the dog get to it. And then you become extremely interesting. If it's when the prey is now spiking it's starting to come on board you can teach the dog very early on that if you have that feeling you get that outlet with me and we, we can shift that for some of you with rehome dogs and you, you're finding that they have a significant amount of this and you've missed that development phase you you have to really be very careful about how you develop this because it's already your dog's already been heavily reinforced for doing the things that you don't want so you're going to have to make sure for a period of time we're talking about addiction you know in the previous episode your dog might be addicted to chasing the birds. You just need to make sure for the next six months there is never an opportunity to do that. Obviously, if the dog's in the backyard, you can't do anything about it. But if you're out and about, you, you, at no point is that reinforced and does your dog get access and you really want to up your play, play game and any sort of engagement type activity with your dog to start shifting that value back to you. You can absolutely do it. You can shift them back, but I'm not suggesting it's not an extremely hard task, especially for some very, very high prey-driven animals. It's exactly what I want to touch on because we have talked about working dogs, but like in my case, I do have a rehome dog and she is as prey-driven as any dog I've ever seen. Like, yeah. it, like it was for a while. If there was a cat, like, oh, heaven help you. Because, mm -hmm. and, and now even last week we saw one, heel, boom, she comes into a heel and that makes me proud, I suppose, but it just says it, that was not a small amount of work to do that. So yeah. don't give up. Just understand with those dogs where I got her when she was 18 months old, didn't have any of that development. It can be done. It just takes a lot of time. So really, to, to just to summarize a little bit, and there are a couple of other sort of minor things that you want to be aware of. Like dogs can be possessive of people and guard them, so that can be a factor, and that might, but that's a very, very small percentage. What we're mostly dealing with is frustration and prey on lead. So dogs that highly value other dogs or dogs that want to just go chase other dogs or fear. In terms of fear, we really want to make that dog feel better within itself first. That's a big part of the process, then start doing a lot of engagement work. In terms of frust uh, frustration or prey-driven dogs, we want to really start sw switch switching uh, the value back to the handler through intense engagement. Now, as this series go on, goes on, we are absolutely going to be breaking down um, the, um, the strategies uh, in, in much, much greater detail so you can start piecing all this together. That, that, de that guarding, um, just one last thing to talk about, just that, that possessive guarding, I think most, a lot of people will default that, be like, oh, my dog's real protective of me. And I almost find that's rarely ever the case that a dog is going to poppycock and be like, hey, get away, this is mine. Not many dogs are built like that. Do you agree? Like, I almost tend to see when people say that, I almost think the dog's probably a little bit spooked protecting itself not necessarily protecting you. Would you, you agree with that? Yeah, completely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be the consensus for sure, yeah. It's, it's, there's very few strong dogs in the community, very, very strong dogs, so that would, there'd be generally another driver, but not to say it can't, it can't happen. Yes. Cool. So the next episode, we will be breaking down handler value and the processes around engagement. So we're really gonna dive deeper into that. We're gonna give you some key strategies, things that you can go away with and start um, doing straight away. See you next time. See you then.